Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Actually, the title is a little bit different from that was on the um, program. I think it's Tunnel Vision, uh, Confirmation Bias from Courtroom to Boardroom to Bedroom. And um, you can think of this talk, if you will, as the, the bi biography of a bias, uh, at least a short version of the biography of a bias. It's a very specific talk. It's, it's interesting when I talk about confirmation bias because on the one hand, it's an exceedingly circumscribed, very narrow topic. On the other hand, it is arguably the broadest topic we have in all of psychology because it cuts across so many, so many domains of, of our thinking and I think is so relevant to the skeptical community. I want to begin my talk with a story. I'm a psychologist by training. One thing we have learned in psychology is that people like stories. We all like stories. We remember them better. Partly we're story-seeking narrative organisms. Our brains tend to work that way. By the way, can everyone hear me all the way back on the bleachers back there? Guys, okay. Uh, if you have any trouble, let me know. And I, and I think, by the way, just an aside, I've always felt that pseudoscientists tend to make really good use of narratives. They love stories, they love anecdotes, and I think we need to do a better job of beating them at their own game, because so often we don't tell good stories. I want to start with a story, and this, as Carl Sagan said, one of the advantages of science, compared to pseudoscience, is it has the advantage of actually being true, or at least uh, partly true. So my story begins on uh, March 11, 2004. These were the famous... Um, Madrid train bombings. As you uh, may remember on this uh, terrible day, a series of coordinated bombings hit Madrid uh, at a train station. 192 people were killed, about 2,000 people injured, including a number of children, although fortunately she, she survived, as shown here. And needless to say, there was a tremendous amount of panic in Spain and also in the U.S., which of course is a close ally of Spain, has also been hit by terrorism quite a bit. And there was a tremendous amount of interest, understandably, in trying to find who the bad guy or bad guys was or were. In the parking lot, not far from where the bombing occurred, a van was found that had some plastic bags next to it. A latent fingerprint was extracted from that plastic bag, and it seemed to match somebody. And attention very soon turned to that somebody, and that somebody was this man, Brandon Mayfield, who was an attorney from Portland, Oregon in the United States. It shocked a lot of Americans, myself included, that an American was involved in these bombings, or seemed to be Mayfield was in many ways a suspicious character, and here is some of the evidence against him. It's a bit overwhelming, but here's some of the piece of evidence that uh, was against him, and, and the Spanish authorities enlisted our FBI, our Federal Bureau of Investigation, in uh, uh, getting Mayfield. The fingerprint match was described 100%, that's a quote, 100% verified by our FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation. The match was later confirmed by no fewer than two other FBI fingerprinting experts, in what was described as an abundance of caution, that fingerprint was later matched yet again by a fourth fingerprinting expert in our FBI. Now, that's just the clear-cut evidence. Then there was a lot of circumstantial evidence that further got the FBI very uh, suspicious that Mayfield was the person. Mayfield was, was not a saint. He'd been uh, arrested as a teenager for some, some petty burglaries. He had married an Islamic wife that also got them quite suspicious, and actually converted to Islam after marrying her, and he was a fairly regular attendee at mosque. As an attorney in the U.S., he had defended a member of the notorious Portland Seven. The Portland Seven were a group of Americans who went over to Afghanistan to fight along with the Taliban, and he was a, a defender of one of those people. Also, the FBI got a warrant, and they searched Mayfield's computer, and they found out that he had, in fact, searched for trips to Spain and like the 9-11 hijackers had been tang, taking flying lessons. All of this obviously was quite overwhelming evidence. Because of this evidence and some others, I'm not showing here, Mayfield was detained for two weeks in this uh, uh, jail in Wisconsin. As the FBI patiently gathered more and more evidence uh, to firm up their case against him. And they waited and waited and waited, gathered more and more evidence. And as the evidence accumulated, something happened. There was a problem. Mayfield was nowhere near Spain when the bombings occurred. In fact, there were multiple problems. His passport had expired, and he had not left the US in about a decade. His fingerprints, in fact, 
did match, but they also matched 20 other people in the FBI database. By the way, you wonder how his thing got in the FBI database. He had actually served a little stint in the US military, so his fingerprint was kind of hanging around there. Uh, the FBI fingerprinting expert initially was under intense time pressure from both the US and Spanish authorities to find a match, understandably. And those later experts I talked about, in fact, were not blinded to the knowledge of the initial identification. And that is an important point I'll come back to. What about those, um, <laughs> what about those mysterious searchers uh, for Spain? Well, his 12-year-old daughter had actually been searching uh, his own computer for a class project she had been doing about Spain. More and more evidence accumulated. And in fact, it turned out those fingerprints did match someone. They matched this Algerian national, I wouldn't doubt who it who eventually confessed to the action. Mayfield, in fact, was completely innocent. Uh, that's actually a photo of him being uh, freed with his attorney next to him. He received a uh, series of apologies from, from our FBI and the US uh, government. And in fact, the Mayfield case now is regularly taught in many US law schools as an example of what can happen when bias goes awry, even among well-intentioned, well-meaning people that can so often occur. If you go to our uh, U.S., you'll see uh, a number of, of statues like this. That's uh, Lady Justice, and one thing you'll notice that Lady Justice has is she is blinded. She's supposed to be blind. She's not supposed to be biased, but in fact, sometimes we know that Lady Justice is not quite, not quite that objective. And this brings us to the topic of my talk. What happens when, in fact, we are blinded by our biases, which so often happens? This is what some have called the mother of all biases. Um, although I, I used to call it that, but actually I have a, a different candidate for that, which I'll get to later. Confirmation bias. Mm. Ray Nickerson, by the way, 1998, if you want to read a good article on it, still probably the best review of it, a bit old now, but still probably the best review of this bias. It's in essence the tendency to favor evidence that supports our hypotheses, our guesses, our hunches, and what I like to call the three Ds of confirmation bias, deny, dismiss, distort evidence that does not. That's an awfully broad definition. I worry sometimes it's almost too broad. We can get into that discussion later. W one key point to remember is that we are all prone to confirmation bias. I'm prone to it. You're prone to it. As we'll see, we're often not aware of it. It often probably happens at a, a largely uh, uh, implicit level. A second important point to remember, it's largely independent of IQ. Studies have shown this. There are a number of measures of confirmation bias. They don't all show exactly the same thing. I'll show one or two measures later. But no matter how you cut it, no matter how you measure it, uh, smart people seem to be almost as prone to confirmation bias as, as uh, people who may, maybe have somewhat lower IQs. There's maybe a little bit of a correlation. I don't want to press it too much. It's maybe a correlation about 0.2 or something, depending on how you cut it. So it's, it's a, there's some association, but it tends to be a modest one. And as many of you know, there is a long legacy of Nobel Prize winners who have embraced really, really bad ideas, including some pseudoscientific ideas that this organization, others have committed. So you could be a real, really smart person, brilliant person, as many Nobel Prize winners have been, Linus Pauling being a famous example, a big believer in orthomolecular therapy, vitamin C therapy for cancer, and, and still fall prey to these kinds of biases. Another point, and... Uh, well, I can talk about some of the evidence here, is there's several studies, it's not a gigantic literature, but there's several studies suggesting that scientists seem to be just about as prone to confirmation bias as non-scientists. If you look at some tasks, including one I'll show later, that's generally been, been found. In fact, Michael Mahoney <laughs> found in one study that scientists were slightly more prone to confirmation bias than their secretaries, uh, although the, <laughs> the results were actually not significant, but they were in that uh, direction, but no, no significant difference uh, there. Uh, Ari Kuglansky, uh, Itor Higgins, two social psychologists, have argued that confirmation bias turns all of us into intuitive lawyers. Lawyers, at least in the US, we have a very strongly adversarial system of justice as opposed to an inquisitorial system. So at least in the US, lawyers are, are basically out to demonstrate their case. That's really what they're trying to do. And the intuitive lawyer within all of us, who I think I would argue lurks inside all of us in many cases, is always seeking evidence to support their position. And again, often implicitly reinforcing, suppressing evidence that uh, is not supportive of that uh, view. My, my own take on this, by the way, is that science and legal system operate using very different kinds of um, 
principles. I've done a little bit of legal work, a little bit of expert testimony work. I'm doing a little bit now, and it's, it's interesting. Uh, struggle as a scientist because they have very different models. In science, you're trying, as I'll argue later, trying to minimize confirmation bias. Not perfectly, but you're, you're trying to muddle through it and minimize your confirmation bias. In the legal system, especially in the U.S., in many ways, both sides are trying to maximize their own confirmation bias with the hope of the trier of fact. Typically, the jury, some cases, the judge can sort through those. And one can argue about which is, is better. But the key point is they're very different models. And when those models come into collision, you often end up having a lot of conflict. Sir Karl Popper, the uh, Austrian philosopher of science, was very attuned to confirmation bias, and, and a lot of Popper's philosophy of science was really geared, I think, to talking about both descriptively and prescriptively how to compensate for confirmation bias. Whenever a theory appears to you as the only possible one, he wrote, take it as a sign. You have neither understood the theory nor the problem it was intended to solve. Great quote. There's a bit of an irony here, as you might know, is that it, Popper actually, ironically, has been criticized by many historians for his own confirmation bias. He was, he was so sure that falsifiability was the lone demarcation criterion distinguishing science from pseudoscience that he was often not very open to other perspectives. So uh, again, we're, we're all compartmentalists. Even brilliant people like Popper may fall prey to confirmation bias. Confirmation bias brings me to the title of my talk, Tunnel Vision, because t confirmation bias can, can lead us to a type of uh, tunnel vision. Um, and more technically, tunnel vision is often referred to as belief uh, perseverance. Sometimes it's called the continued influence effect in the communication literature. What's that up there? You may wonder, that is a, um, a suicide note. <clears throat> and uh, that, that was the subject of a study by, by Ross, Lepper, and Hubbard in 1975. That was the first major experimental study of belief perseverance. What they did is they got a sample of actual suicide notes from psychiatric patients, like uh, this one shown here. And then they got some fake suicide notes uh, they determined that most people couldn't tell the difference between them. They're very hard to tell the difference between, by the way. And they got some undergraduates to distinguish real from fake notes. They basically asked them, try to tell which ones are real, which ones are fake. And here's the trick. They used a bit of deception, and they gave the students completely bogus feedback. They randomly assigned some of them to tell them they were really good at it, others they were really bad at it. <laughs> Uh, and then they kind of went through these notes and, and uh, yep, that's right, no, that's not good. So some people were getting feedback they were really good, others they were not very good. <laughs> then after the study, they basically said, thanks, the study is over. By the way, we have something to tell you. Uh, all the feedback you got was completely bogus. Uh, it was totally random. We lied to you. We just made it up and so on. And it turned out all, they actually verified that all participants bought that bogus feedback. But it's okay, well, we understand that. They verified, yes, we understand the feedback was, was bogus, more or less. Then later, in the context of a somewhat ostensibly different experiment, they asked people, just out of curiosity, how good do you think you are at distinguishing real from fake suicide notes? And unfortunately, no, there are no error bars on this graph, what there ought to be. But making a long story short, the people who were told that they were good at it, in fact, later rated themselves as better than the people who didn't. That information should have been wiped clean from their mental slates. It was not wiped clean. That's a great example of this continued influence effect, belief, perseverance. I know it's like in Poland, but in the US, we have this thing, and there are actually experimental studies of this, where sometimes attorneys will try to kind of slip in something subtle about a defendant when they're not supposed to, like someone's previous criminal history, and the judge will sometimes say, uh, jury, please strike that from, they'll tell the person, strike that from the record, please forget about that. And the studies have shown, experimental studies show that jurors will say, yeah, I'm not thinking about that anymore. I've, I've stricken that from a metal record when it has not. It actually continues to influence juror verdicts, even when jurors are sure they have managed to disregard that information. That information sometimes can, and probably in some cases should lead to mistrials. How is it relevant to uh, uh, the, our organization? Well, belief, perseverance, confirmation bias probably plays a role in explaining why some people continue to believe discredited ideas. We're often surprised that so many people continue to believe that vaccines cause autism, even when the evidence is overwhelming that it does not. There's not even good correlational evidence, let alone causal evidence for it, but a lot of smart people still believe it. And there are still, last I checked, about 500 world members of the Flat Earth Society. One of them, but I don't know if he's a member of it, although he ought to be, 
Uh, one other believer in the flat earth is a basketball superstar in the U.S., Kyrie Irving. Um, I'm not even sure what he means by that. Conspiracy. The earth is flat. Uh, that gave um, poor Neil deGrasse Tyson a big, uh, a big headache there. Uh, but, but again, a, a, lot of, a lot of people, uh, flat earths are, are pretty rare, but, uh, but we're all prone to some extent to believe uh, perseverance. Now, I, I think oftentimes as uh, skeptics, we make the mistake, and I probably made this mistake too, of thinking that most of us are, are, are or should be fairly rational organisms who are not influenced by, by emotion or, or motivation. We know that's not true. Confirmation bias technically is a cognitive phenomenon that is involving thinking. But we also know that it is a phenomenon that is very much fueled by motivation. So when we are strongly motivated, inclined to believe something, confirmation bias often will kick in, and kick in in very powerful ways that will distort our reasoning processes. The late Ziva Kunda, who, who passed away all, all too young at uh, Waterloo in Canada, referred to this now very familiar term in psychology as motivated reasoning. We, we're all prone to engage in motivated reasoning from, from time to time. When we want to believe something, we often will find a way to believe it, and oftentimes, I'm going to summarize about 30 years of psychological research in one sentence, which is grossly unfair, but I think there's a good deal of evidence suggesting that in many domains, I'm, I'm going to simplify things here, but many domains, we often arrive at the conclusion we like and then reason our way into it later. Uh, my friend Carol Tavares uh, has pointed this out too, uh, uh, believing is seeing. Um, rather than seeing is believing, although there's some truth to both, but believing certainly is seeing. Once we have a belief, um, we see the information that confirms that belief, and, and again, um, motivation can often play a powerful role in interacting, fueling, fostering confirmation bias. I'm going to disappoint you because of time. I'm not going to talk as much about the bedroom as I'd like, other than to say that <laughs> love is blind, I think, captures this confirmation bias very well. I think most of us have been there. I have. Um, <laughs> we've all had this experience of falling madly in love with someone and not, not seeing uh, people's faults when we should. This is tricky because actually there's a little bit of evidence that these so-called positive illusions may actually be a bit healthy in the early stages of a relationship. It may be a bit healthy, adaptive when you're deliriously in love with someone to see only good things about them, but of course the danger is that can last too long, and it's one thing to sort of see the best thing about someone when you're first in love with them, but if the person begins to mistreat you badly, eventually confirmation bias can, can take over and prevent you from seeing reality uh, clearly. And in terms of the boardroom, one could easily give a whole talk on the role of confirmation bias in the business world. Many people have argued that confirmation bias, and I think probably allied biases too, like groupthink and others I won't talk about here, certainly played a substantial role in the financial crash uh, on Wall Street and, and others that, that really in many ways crashed the, the world economy. It's, it's very easy because of confirmation bias, and again, allied kinds of biases that, that uh, are fueled by it uh, to live in a bubble. But on the one hand, I, I don't want to exaggerate things here too much because, yeah, confirmation bias is powerful, but in, in most of us, it is to some degree constrained by reality. So, and, and Ziva couldn't have made this point, there's often this kind of give and take. We do see reality, most of us, somewhat as it is, but confirmation bias can kick in, particularly when situations are unclear, particularly when situations are ambiguous. The evidence is pretty clear. That's when confirmation bias is most likely to kick in. I show here, this is our U.S. sport of baseball, and one thing that baseball managers love to do in baseball is whenever a, a, they don't like a call, they can run onto the field and argue it, okay, which usually makes no difference. I don't know why they do this, but, but it makes, makes them feel better. But they run on the field and argue the call with the, uh, that guy, the umpire there. And one thing you'll see if you watch baseball is most of the time managers just kind of sit in the dugout. They don't, they don't say anything. Uh, there are lots of calls that go against them. But when the call is close, they will go and argue it. Now, you could argue, maybe that's just because when the call is close, they think they can win the call. But... Eh as I'll show later in a study, it's probably a bit more than that. It's prob they probably may be seeing the call actually to some extent subjectively differently uh, than the other manager. The, uh, the term confirmation bias was coined by Peter Wason in the 1960s. I showed a picture of him earlier. Peter Wason was a cognitive psychologist who passed away a couple years ago, but in fact, people have talked about confirmation bias or things very much like it uh, throughout the years. Julius Caesar supposedly said something about this. Um, uh, we readily believe when, when we wish. Uh, we imagine others think so also. That, by the way, is another bias called the false consensus effect, which 
probably makes confirmation bias even worse. We actually tend to think everyone agrees with us, uh, which probably just uh, fosters further confirmation bias. Uh, Sir Francis Bacon, uh, a very famous quote, general root of superstition is that men, and by the way, women too, uh, observe when things hit and uh, not when they miss. So confirmation bias often leads us to, to see the hits and not the misses. This one's interesting. I put this one up because uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was uh, the brainchild of uh, the brilliant Sherlock Holmes, and Sherlock Holmes said, but of course Doyle wrote it, uh, it's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. The reason I'm laughing is because that's exactly what Doyle did. Um, <laughs> uh, so most of you know the famous Cottley fairies a hoax. Uh, if you don't know those, uh, <laughs> these were photographs taken around 1917 and 1920. This, these were two young sisters who supposedly claimed that they were encountering fairies in their garden. Oops. Um, and uh, I mean, they kind of always look fake, right? But, um, and a lot of people say, wait a minute, those are, <laughs> those are fake. And as you may know, they were eventually traced uh, to really crappy cardboard cutouts in a children's book. But even before that, and eventually the, the sisters uh, fessed up very late in their lives, but, but even before that, there were several experts who call these uh, photos into question. One who basically said, these are conclusively fake. Doyle would have none of that. So he, Doyle was not only a big supporter of the cotton leaf fairies, but even when the evidence was coming out that they were almost certainly faked photographs from photographic experts, he continued to believe in it. Again, belief perseverance. How do we measure confirmation bias? There are several ways of doing it, but uh, one uh, classic way is the waste and selection task. By the way, how many people have seen the waste and selection task? Oh, so, okay, actually not as many as I thought, so maybe about a, a fifth or sixth of you. Uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, I'll, I'll walk you through this. And there are different variants of it, by the way. There's no uh, single version of it, but uh, one variant of it is shown here. In, in most waste and selection tasks, there are four cards. So imagine those are cards, and each one has a letter on one side, a number on the other. And I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you the easy version of it. What you have to do is you have to turn over in this version two cards to test a rule. Basically, you're testing a hypothesis. So. In this particular version of it, the hypothesis you want to test is the following. So read this carefully. Is the following statement true or false? If a card is a vowel on one side, then it has an even number on the other side. And I, <laughs> while you're deciding on your answer, I'll tell you a little story about this. I, I rarely get nervous before talks, but one I got nervous about this is about five or six years ago. I was giving a talk in, in Canada, and they, they hadn't told me the whole story. They said, oh, it's going to be kind of a big talk. And, um, because they knew I did some work on biases. And uh, you're going to be talking to some Canadian judges and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, but, okay. Uh, but I said it's going to be a big talk. Okay. Um, anyway, I gave the talk, and it turned out uh, I discovered like about, it's good I only found it like an hour before the talk, because I would have gotten really nervous. It turned out that the majority of people in the talk were members of the Canadian Supreme Court. Um, there are actually 13 Supreme Courts in Canada, I discovered. Um, but I got to meet these brilliant men and women, and they were all really, really smart. I had uh, wine and cheese with them, all incredibly smart. But get to the clunch line, about 80% of them got this one wrong. And by the way, the, the reason they had this, they, they had like these little, they have this, something like the millionaire game in Poland, where they have like a little, they press a button and the numbers show up. They, you know, so it was like that. It was, it was kind of, I gave, I gave them these little quizzes, they pressed a button, the numbers all came up. So instantaneously, I was able to look and I went, Oh, they did no better than my undergraduates at, at Emory. It's kind of funny. And uh, on this task, about 80% of them picked A and 4. And if you picked A and 4, don't feel bad, uh, because, again, you're in, in good company. The, the optimal answer, as we now know, is A and 7. If you pick a, f uh, if you got A, by the way, give yourself part credit. But the 4, as we know, uh, can only confirm the hypothesis. It cannot disconfirm it. Only the 7 can disconfirm the hypothesis. Uh, if it turned out there were uh, an, a vowel on that side. Why do I like this waste and selection task? Because it shows very powerfully that, that disconfirmatory thinking does not come naturally to the human brain. It's not easy. By the way, every time I look at it, I kind of want to turn over that four <laughs> card too, even though it's not going to uh, tell me a whole lot. Disconfirmatory thinking is not natural to the human species. Uh, that may help to explain why in reality science is fairly new in the course of human history. It really didn't. I mean, obviously, there were hints of it in ancient Greece and the ancient Arab world, but it really didn't evolve in full bloom until uh, the European Enlightenment. Um, there are three biases more or less rolled into one when it comes to confirmation bias. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not going to talk about the third because of time, although I will come back to it if I have a minute and just say something about it in the context of a, a man named Charles Darwin. Uh, so I, I worry a little bit that the term has gotten too broad, that the more classic form of confirmation bias is this first one, selectively seeking out confirming information, ignoring disconfirming information. There's also uh, what sometimes, sometimes it's called congeniality bias, we're seeking out evidence that's congenial to our kind of worldview. Uh, there's also selective interpretation, distortion of information, sometimes biased assimilation. I won't say as much about the third one, uh, which is a memory effect. Some people do consider that a part of confirmation bias, too. Let me just say a little bit, um, actually, let me mention this quote. W one danger, by the way, of, of um, learning about confirmation bias, as John Ronson points out, is you can fall prey to your own confirmation bias and start seeing confirmation bias everywhere. So you have to be a bit careful about that uh, error. Uh, I'm skip. Oh, there we are. So let me talk about the first very briefly, selectively seeking out information. Here's an old study. I put this one up. There's actually some, I think, some better, newer studies, but I kind of like this one. Uh, it's not that widely cited by Brock and, and by the way, in fact, I hadn't known about it until five or six years ago. What they did, and by the way, for, for younger, I have to tell my young students about this, so uh, at least in the U.S., uh, that's what we call a tape recorder, by the way. Uh, a lot of my no students, they look at that, what is, what is that? Okay, uh, I'm, I'm making this up. Uh, they have no idea what that, that little uh, gadget is, but it's a tape recorder. So what they did is they, they had people listen to a, a tape and they pre-selected participants, some of whom to be highly religious. I think they got like fundamentalist Christians or something. Then they got some atheists. I wonder if they were like, they met each other in the lab or something. It would have been interesting. But anyway, they got some fundamentalist Christians, some atheists, to listen to a tape. And it turned out this tape was a, a message that contained some very rabid anti-Christianity material. A lot of the stuff on the tape was fairly innocuous, and it was someone kind of talking. But it was some lecturer. They actually got some lecturer who was giving arguments against God and basically trying to argue why the existence of God was, was implausible. And they basically had people listen to the tape. And this is the clever part of it. On this, uh, on this little tape recorder gadget, they had a little button, and this button controlled uh, static. There was some white noise on the, uh, there was, was kind of, you could sort of hear what the person was saying, but the white noise was kind of written on top of the tape. So it was a little hard to hear what the person was saying. You could kind of hear it, but you couldn't make it out extremely well. And they gave participants the chance to, to mute that button and get rid of the white noise. The question is, uh, who does what, and it's a lovely finding. What you see is that uh, whenever the tape got to the parts of the message that were extremely anti-Christianity, the atheists, boom, <laughs> they, want to hear, they want to hear it more clearly. The religious people, of course, kept the uh, white noise back on. Uh, they, they didn't want to hear it very well. The, the only flaw in this study, it's not a fatal flaw, but I, I would have liked them to have done it both ways and looked at uh, the receptivity of atheists to... Uh, uh, pro-God messages. But in any case, that's an example of, at least in principle, of uh, congeniality bias. Classic study for number two, selectively interpreting information. I mentioned uh, uh, the baseball effect. This one's on our, our U.S. sport of football. Uh, cl classic study, they saw a game by Hastroff and Cantrell, 1956. This is a, a study of a, um, a famous game between two colleges in the U.S., um, Princeton and Dartmouth, which are no longer any good in football, but back then I guess they had good football teams. From what I understand about this game, it was a really ugly game. A lot of penalties, and I think at one point like a player was carted off the field with a broken leg. A, lot, a very dirty, ugly game. It became uh, notorious. Uh, back then, of course, most people didn't have television sets, so most Princeton and Dartmouth fans did not see the game. And uh, soon after the game was over, they had a videotape of the game, and they showed it to Princeton and Dartmouth fans who had not been there, and they asked them to identify every time one team had committed a foul, a penalty, and what you saw here was a, a, a confirmation bias effect. The, the Princeton fans tended to see the Dartmouth fans making more penalties and vice versa. Uh, so they, they were seeing uh, the, the penalties somewhat differently. Now, again, to be clear, just to come back to my, my point about being constrained by reality, I think sometimes people misinterpret this study. I've seen some people actually say they literally saw two different games, some textbooks. So, no, they didn't really see two different games. In fact, on most of the trials, for most plays, they agreed. But again, when the plays were ambiguous, when they could have been seen either, either way, that's when confirmation bias tended to kick in. Again, confirmation bias is there, but it's constrained by reality. I've often thought, I'm not sure this is a great definition, but I've often thought that one potential definition of delusional thinking is confirmation bias that's not constrained by reality. So that's, having worked with delusional patients, that's typically what I see, is that their confirmation bias runs rampant. There's no constraint whatsoever by external reality.
So explanations for confirmation bias, how am I doing on time? Okay, about seven, eight minutes. Um, let me just take a minute on this slide. This is again summarizing a, a huge body of literature. These explanations are not mutually exclusive in my view. One, and I think, I think there's some truth to this, is that it's kind of a basic default strategy because it's, it's kind of usually kind of right uh, most of the time. When, when you go back to your hotel rooms tonight or wherever you're staying, you're gonna uh, open uh, the door with your key and you're gonna open, uh, look, look inside and you're gonna notice a room that looked a lot like the room it did this morning. Uh, five minutes, okay. Um, and uh, probably it was the same room. No, it's possible that someone diabolically went in and changed everything and made it look exactly like your room. Um, and it's actually not the same furniture. But probably not, it's probably is your room. And so again, confirmation bias generally works reasonably well. Number two, we're all cognitive misers. Uh, miser, for those of you who don't know, that's a word in English that kind of means being cheap. And, and most of the time we're kind of lazy. Our, our cognitive apparatus is kind of lazy. And that's okay, I mean, we, we don't want to go around checking every single perception we have. We'd go crazy if we did that. And of course, nothing is more annoying than being in a relationship with someone who keeps asking you, do you love me, do you love me? You know, I love you, do you really love me? You know, it's, it's not very adaptive. So in most cases, it's good to be cognitively miserly most of the time. Uh, and it's also annoying if you're not. Um, when emotion comes into play, cognitive dissonance it also plays a role. Cognitive dissonance is the fact that when we have two uh, beliefs that come into question, particularly data show when they question our self concept. We often like to push one away, and that probably fuels confirmation bias as well. Uh, number four, I won't say as much about, uh, there's uh, some interesting work by Hugo Mercer. I'm a little skeptical of this, but he has a whole interesting evolutionary model called the argumentative theory of reasoning, uh, which in turn argues that uh, reasoning evolved in the human mind mostly to persuade others. It didn't, it didn't evolve so much to to win, uh, to, well, put it this way, it involved more to win arguments uh, than to get at the truth. Again, I have, it's an interesting argument, I have some doubts about it, but we can talk about that. In, in the last uh, four or five minutes, let me say a little bit about um, the role of confirmation bias in, in science. We know that scientists seem to be just as prone to confirmation bias as everybody else. Is it a concern in science? Well, there's some debate about this in the philosophy of science literature. Some scientists say, nah, not that, it's, it's not that big a deal because in the long run, confirmation bias will take care of itself because science is self-correcting. Of course, as John Maynard Keynes famously said, in the long run, we're all dead, right? So the, the problem is, is it going to correct in time? There's a quote uh, on this. Uh, scientists generally can, uh, are capable of evaluating findings as to, as to their worth. Some philosophers, and I, I can sympathize with this view. I think there's some truth to it. Some, some philosophers of science have said scientists maybe should use uh, a confirm early, disconfirm late heuristic, that is, it may be good to have a little bit of confirmation bias in the early phases of science, that is, when you have a theory, you don't want to give the theory up just because they're like one or two potentially negative findings. You may want to persist a little bit. The question is, how much are you going to persist? So here's another story. Um, so many of you may know this story. I think I heard some of you say Percival Lovell. Many of you know him, famous American astronomer. If you don't know Lovell's story, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful one. Uh, that's a, um, but also a kind of sad one in a certain way, too, for Lovell, anyway. Um, that's, that's a photo of him peering through his telescope around the turn of the 20th century. L Lovell, justifiably, is regarded today as a great astronomer. He was a wonderful observational astronomer, made some important discoveries. Some of his discoveries actually indirectly led to the discovery of, of uh, the planet, well, no longer planet Pluto, uh, once a planet. But L Lovell, he was proud of those discoveries, but he was much more proud of what he thought was his greatest discovery, which he thought, as you may know, was probably the single greatest scientific discovery of all time. He thought he had discovered conclusive proof of life on Mars. The story begins uh, in the 1870s. The Italian astronomer Schiaparelli, as you may know, uh, drew these uh, interesting maps of, of the Martian surface. Schiaparelli wasn't sure what they were. He called them canali, uh, uh, and he was actually pretty agnostic of what those were, but as many of you know the story, they got translated in English as canals, and Lovell sort of thought, well, maybe he's actually seeing canals on, on Mars. And it turned out that around that time, and here's where confirmation bias, I suspect, is kicking in, around that time, the idea of canals was getting big. The Suez Canal had recently been built in Egypt. There was an unsuccessful attempt to build the Panama Canal uh, in Panama. So the idea of canals was kind of in the air. It was in the culture, and Oh my goodness, okay. Uh, started uh, observing the Martian surface, 
And sure enough, he began seeing more and more and more canals. Eventually, he saw several hundred <laughs> canals. Um, uh, and they got more and more detail. One other lovely illustration of confirmation bias is that he could only observe Mars very well at certain times of the year. So he would uh, kind of come back a year, a year later and begin observing them. And he found the canals had changed. Like some of them seemed to have disappeared and there seemed to be some new ones. Now, you might have thought that might have called some, some of his observations to question. Well, maybe, maybe I'm actually not seeing what's there. But instead, he took it as exactly the opposite observation. He took that as more evidence that, in fact, these canals were proof of intelligent life because that's what happens in a civilization. You know, build some streets, you renovate other ones, and that kind of stuff. So this actually further fueled his confirmation bias. It was not, by the way, until the mid-1960s that... Um, when, this is from the Mariner mission, when NASA went to Mars, that the idea of the Martian canals was completely uh, falsified. And interestingly, from what I read somewhere, in the early 1970s, there were still some astronomy textbook in, in the US that were referring to the Martian uh, canals. Um, there's a little postscript of the story, and then I'll, I'll end here with one or two final points. The, um, this is a postscript that many people don't know about. It turned out that Lowell, uh, Lowell not only well, not only was observing the canals on Mars, but he was also observing what he called spokes on Venus. And these were they called spokes because they're kind of a bit like bicycle spokes, right? And um, of course, we now know that whatever Lowell was seeing, they were not spokes on the surface of Venus because the surface of Venus, of course, is not observable from Earth because of Venus's extremely thick atmosphere, but Lowell uh, didn't know that. Uh, so he had these interesting uh, drawings of spokes on Venus. What was going on there? Well. In 2003, an astronomer teamed up in a remarkable paper with an ophthalmologist. Yes, I, I said that correctly. Ophthalmologist, if you don't know, that's the person who studies the eye. It turned out the ophthalmologist had been looking at these spokes and noticed a kind of interesting resemblance uh, to something. And um, <laughs> said, wow, that's kind of interesting. They, they kind of look a bit like the blood vessels at the back of the eye. It turned out that they then were able to get hold of Lowell's original telescope, and it turned out it had a very unusual construction. It was a refracting telescope uh, that actually, if you looked through it, you actually saw a very dim reflection of your own eyeball in the telescope. <laughs> so it, it's very likely that the entire time with Venus, and perhaps even with Mars, Lowell for decades was actually observing the back of his own eye, which <laughs> some people have argued may have been the single most prolonged optical illusion in history. Um, so there are going to be some brief quizzes on all of these slides later, which, I, oh yeah, let me just mention real quickly here, this is maybe where I'll end. I have a couple of slides at the end which I won't get to, although I can show them at the question and answer period <clears throat> if you want. Um, um, but to me, what this comes down to, I had one or two slides, a couple of slides on humility, which I'll, I won't show, but I can say a bit about. To me, what does this tell us? I think, to me, I think, the term, we've seen some wonderful talks about this, the term skepticism I think sometimes has a bad reputation. Uh, it doesn't deserve it, but I think it has it. And I think to me, one, one point we need to, to get across more clearly is what skepticism fundamentally is about, is about epistemic humility, humility in our own knowledge. And, and I think if we, need, if we say that and make that point more clearly, I think as an organization, we'd all be better off. So I'll end with this wonderful quote from Charles Darwin, which I promised I'd get to. It's one of my favorite quotes in science. I'll read it. Uh, I had also, during many years, followed a golden rule, namely that uh, whenever a published fact, a new observation of thought came across to me, which was opposed to my general results, to make a memorandum of it without fail and at once, for I had found by experience that such facts and thoughts were far more apt to escape from the memory than favorable ones. Isn't that a great quote? So what he's basically saying is, I mean, that's to me what made Darwin such a great scientist. Obviously, he made uh, remarkable discoveries. What made him a great scientist is he had what psychologists would call a small bias blind spot. Bias blind spot is, I mentioned earlier, uh, what I think the real mother of all biases is. Bias blind spot is the fact that we're often unaware of our own biases, including our own confirmation bias. What made Darwin a great scientist, obviously, was his, his smarts, his remarkable uh, perceptual abilities, his remarkable integration abilities, but what also made him a truly great scientist was his ability to be aware of his own uh, confirmation bias. And, and I think to me, in some ways, that may be one of the single most important messages we can uh, confirm as skeptics. I'm over time. I'm out of here. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.